Big Ten football media days are here, and Michigan took center stage. We'll break it all down with our thoughts on the Wolverines next on Michigan Podcast. But there's going to be one team that's going to play solely as a team. No man is more important than the team. No coach is more important than the team. The team, the team, the team. Looks deep for Anthony Clark. Waits for it. Yep. Caught. Hey, hey, hey. They said you can't do hard stuff. Now what? Brady gets terrific. Throws it. And a touchdown night again. Schultz just before Brazil got him. And a leaping interception by Woodson. Harbaugh back to throw over the middle. Caught by Collins at the five on his feet. Touchdown, Michigan. On his way. It's good. He's 5'7", 179 pounds, a junior at Michigan. But Jamie Morris packs a wallop, and he delivers for Bo Schimbeck. And here's your first play. Pressure coming. Sack. It is Glenn Steele, number 81, who fought his way through the traffic. Option. And Robinson calls his own number, and he's going to score. Oh, an easy touchdown for Robinson and Michigan. win the championship again because we're going to play as a team. And when we play as a team, and the old season is over, you and I know it's going to be Michigan again. Michigan. Go Blue! I'm Steve Dace. Welcome to this week's episode of Michigan Podcast. And we have made it. The long national nightmare is over. We have, I know we say this every summer, but we have made it to Big Ten Football Media Days, which is really the unofficial kickoff to the 2022 and every college football season. A week from today, we're taping this on Wednesday, July the 27th. A week from today, August 3rd, the Wolverines report for summer camp. Northwestern Nebraska, they're reporting for training camp today because they start the season in week zero in Dublin, Ireland. We have the NFL training camps opening up, the Hall of Fame game just around the corner. The most wonderful time of the year is almost here. So we soak it all in yesterday watching all of the content that Michigan provided, both the players and the coaches that were, or the head coach that was in attendance at Big Ten Football Media Days in Indianapolis. Here are five things that stuck out to me the most. Let's start with number one here. I thought Harbaugh seemed loose and relaxed when away from the podium again. I think we saw this last year where he was, well, human uh, when talking to the media and to people. Um, You actually got a chance to see the player that he used to be that was so charismatic and engaging. We haven't seen that a lot in the early years with him as a head coach. We certainly saw it last off season. That trend continued into this off season as well. Now, listen, Jim Harbaugh at the podium. I don't know if that's ever going to be a thing. It's clear he disdains it. And he acted like that for the most part uh, at the podium. But away from the podium, he could not have been more engaging. I listened to a couple of interviews he gave, one to Sirius XM. It was very funny talking about when his pants were on fire at Penn State last year and how Dalen Baldwin just kind of casually mentioned him that you're on fire, so he didn't believe it. Uh, He was very engaging with the BTN crew. And I think if, like me, you have followed closely Michigan football since the advent of the Big Ten Network, you know that Michigan and the BTN's relationship is, well, complicated so it was good to see these things because it also shows that when Jim thinks the team is going to be good or he his back is against the wall like last year that he that's when he tends to be more open and engaging as opposed to when he's not so sure so I will take that as a good sign next for the first time I can remember Harbaugh clearly communicated the team's goals and 
you know, I remember in 2019 he was asked, hey, you guys were picked to win the championship in the Cleveland Plain Dealer media poll. You know, what do you think and where would you pick you? I mean, he, at that point he can't say, well, I mean, I think we're going to have a 9-3 and three season. He's got to say, well, I'd pick us to win it. This is the first time I can ever remember Jimmy forthrightly providing team goals and laying out what they are. Hell, most coaches don't do that, even of great programs. So um, I think that is, again, indicative of the confidence that this program has right now. Remember Jim said during the summer or during the spring that he thought the program was scary good right now. This is the team that was supposed to rise up to challenge Ohio State, not last year's team. I mean, the goal last year was to try to win as many games to, to make it to this point rather than having to make a head coaching change. But this is the team. It doesn't have the star power of an Aiden Hutchinson, obviously. But when you look at the overall depth on this team, Michigan, for the first time in a long time, is pretty much three deep everywhere with one or two exceptions probably. And I think that is one of the reasons he's confident most of all. The third thing that stood out to me during Big Ten football media days Harbaugh made it clear it's an open quarterback competition between Cade McNamara and J.J. McCarthy. He went on to say, hey, it's going to be tough to beat out Cade McNamara for the starting quarterback job in camp. Then he turned right around and said it's going to be tough to beat out J.J. McCarthy for the starting quarterback job in camp. He did reiterate that Cade is the incumbent when we start camp. Next week, he'll take the first snap with the ones, but after that, it is on. Now, what I think is fascinating is if Cade wins the job, there is still ample opportunity for J.J. to play and to play more than he did last year with another year of experience. If J.J. wins the job, how does Cade play? I mean, what would Cade bring to the table that J.J. does not? On the other hand, J.J. brings certainly at least a couple of things to the table that Cade does not, which is why fans tend to want to see J.J. They think that's the higher ceiling, but... I don't think it's the worst thing in the world if they try to go with the same arrangement they had last year with just a more expanded role than J.J. had last year with more experience. But that really is incumbent on can those two guys, you know, last year J.J. was the fresh-faced kid. Cade was fine rooting him on. Now it's very clear that it's a challenge and a competition for the job. Can they still manage that for a second year? I think that's more challenging than anything else is the dynamic between the two of them. Fourth, Harbaugh said this year's, quote, no-name defense might be even better. And he said, hey, I remember some no-name defenses that turned out to be really good. And he was talking about the 85 defense, a team that he played on that finished number two in the final polls. That was a lot like last year's team. Difficult schedule, coming off a terrible year, not ranked in the preseason polls, and then ends up having uh, one of the great seasons in modern history, a lot like last year's team. Now, last year's team did have at least one bona fide star, and it was on defense in Aiden Hutchinson. This year is a bunch of no names, but these guys are all very highly recruited. Again, if you look at Michigan from a depth standpoint, except for maybe a linebacker spot, Maybe a safety spot. Michigan is pretty much three uh, three deep at every single one of these positions. With that kind of competition, and you get through camp at the end, you've got to think that kind of competition with that much depth comes up with a pretty good starting unit. And the way Michigan plays defense with the, with the multiple looks, a lot of guys will get to play as well. I actually am going to make this prediction right now. Michigan will actually have more sacks this year than it had last year. And I think a lot of it has to do with how good the offense is going to be. I think offensively, they're going to bury some a lot of these teams, particularly early in the schedule. They're going to bury those teams early offensively, and they're going to be throwing the ball every down to catch up. And that means pin your ears back and get after the quarterback. Don't worry about a handoff. So I think Michigan will actually have more sacks than what it had last year when it had the historic duo in Ojabo and Hutchinson. I just don't know that anybody will have like more than seven or eight. Finally, The fifth and final thing that stuck out to me about Harbaugh and Big Ten Media Days in general, Eric All, Michigan's standout tight end, he claimed he had no idea that USC and UCLA were coming to the Big Ten until he was asked about it during a live interview. Now, this happened on Sirius XM Radio, and he was asked by the host, a Michigan grad, Jason Horowitz, he was asked by him, uh, hey, your thoughts on USC and UCLA coming to the Big Ten, and do you guys care? I mean, you're a senior, and they won't be here for two more years, so maybe it's not a big deal to you. And he was stunned. Eric was like, what? He had no idea. This news only happened over the 4th of July. He had no idea that USC and UCLA were coming to the Big Ten. He just said, listen, man, I'm, I'm a football player. 
I'm just grinding away, getting ready for the season. I don't follow the media. I don't you know, follow what gets said there. I have no idea what's going on. So if that's indicative to the level of focus this team has, I guess that can be a good thing, right? Let's get the perspective of our one and only reasonable and liked Buckeye fan, Mark Rogers, here next. Well, let's get the view from the other side of the scarlet and gray septic tank with our good friend, Mark Rogers, who himself has a fantastic channel right here on YouTube, the voice of college football. And he's got stringers and correspondents covering teams all over the country. It is good to have you back, Mark. And when you are not covering college football, you are attempting, albeit it is a difficult chore, uh, to be a reasonable bucknut, my friend. How are you? I am doing just fine. I'm trying to recover from watching... Uh your boy Jim Harbaugh uh, at Big Ten Media Days on Tuesday because I'm a bit worried, Steve, because either he's getting clear with his speech and with his declaratives or I'm just worried about myself because I'm understanding him better these days. Yeah, I don't know that he's ever going to be Mr. Podium guy. He just doesn't seem to like that. But, I mean, you couldn't get anything good out of him for years. And then last year... Um, all off season heading into the year, he decided to actually, you know, be more human. I don't know how else to describe it, but actually engage and relate people because I mean, we would, we would watch him from a media perspective and we're like, like you actually talk to recruits moms in their homes and stuff. Right. I mean, it was just very, very awkward last year. He decided, you know what? Hell my back's against the wall. I'm going to actually maybe let people in and be a human being and, uh, be the guy that you watched on Saved by the Bell back in the day. And it seemed to work. And so this year he, he did the same thing. I mean, I, I could not believe. I, I used to listen in the early years of Jim when he'd do these interviews on Sirius XM at Media Days, and it was cringe-inducing, man. I mean, it was, you know, I mean, he did everything other than I'm here so I don't get fined, okay? But like yesterday, man, he's telling stories about how he had to yell at Dalen Baldwin, a former receiver here who uh, was the one who told him he was on fire on the sidelines against Penn State. And he's like, hey, coach, man, you're on fire. And he thought it was a joke until he was literally engulfed in flames. He was like, next time someone's on fire, more enthusiasm, please. I mean, he was even joking with the BTN crew, and the Michigan people don't like the BTN crew at all. They they kind of think they've kind of had it in for Michigan, Donardo especially, ever since Lloyd Carr retired. So, I mean, there was one year that uh, Howard Griffith's son was being recruited by Notre Dame, and we were opening the season against them, and he got barred during the camp tour. He was not allowed to watch any Michigan campus because his kid had committed to Notre Dame and they were getting ready to play the Irish. So it, it is a different atmosphere than what we're used to around here uh, with Jim, for sure. Yeah, and it's good to see. Now, obviously, we can go a number of directions here, but the most declarative statement he made was, of course, setting up the four goals. And so he's already accomplished three of those and two in the same season, of course. So the Michigan State loss, unless you're really into the rivalry, did not get in Michigan's way of completing the next two goals of defeating Ohio State and winning the Big Ten Championship. So mission accomplished. But considering where the rivalry's been, meaning the Michigan State rivalry, way beyond Harbaugh and then throughout his tenure, which I believe stands at three and four and 10 losses in 14 years. uh, Yeah, I think that's a good goal to have to make it uh, a statement to start out that we need to beat Michigan State. And I understand you can read between the lines. I'm 0-2 against Mel Tucker. So got to beat Michigan State, got to beat Ohio State. We've done that. We've proven that. So we can state that as a goal. As opposed to the comparison to last year's statement was, we are going to beat Ohio State or I'm going to die trying. Mm-hmm. So it wasn't a guarantee, but it was a guarantee that this means a whole lot to me and I'm going to do my very best. I mean, that was a prophecy. I mean, he knew that they had to win that game to guarantee he'd be back. I mean, I suppose they could have gone 11. They could have lost last year and gone 10 and 2. And Michigan wasn't going to fire a Heisman Trophy finalist, first quarterback to ever throw a touchdown pass in the NFL for going 10 and 2. They weren't going to do that. But the likelihood that Michigan was going to have the season that uh, he needed to have without beating Ohio State also in August of last year wasn't a foreseeable thing either. So I'm, I'm, I'm reminded of what George Perlis said 
uh, when he took Michigan State to the Rose Bowl in 1988. And uh, back then, I think that was the last year NBC had the Rose Bowl deal. And Dick Enberg, who's a Michigan native, asked him in the pregame, hey, I mean, you were prophetic. You predicted when you took this job five years ago that you were going to take Michigan State to the Rose Bowl in five years. How did you know you're going to get it done? And Perlis said, well, I had a five-year contract, Dick. And if we didn't go to the Rose Bowl in five years, I knew it wasn't going to be a six-year contract. So it was an easy prediction to make, right? That's kind of where Jimmy was last year. All right, he knew that it was beat Ohio State or literally die trying, like literally from a career standpoint. So I, I think that what's funny is – Remember to our conversations last year at this time. And then I kept telling you that the reason they gave all those coaches two-year deals is because this was the team that they actually expected to be the one that would step up to challenge Ohio State. And then the, the, the goal was, could they win enough games this year, meaning 2021, to get to that season, meaning 2022? Well, lo and behold... Aiden Hutchinson went Hugh Green 1980 and just took the entire Michigan team on his back, right? And um, and the Michigan offensive line was a throwback to what you have seen from Michigan offensive lines for uh, for decades prior to this last current one. And they ended up catching some lightning in a bottle. But this is really the team that they were expecting to take a next step. And you and I have been talking about this all this offseason. There is this urban legend among Bucknut Twitter and Big Ten Twitter that Michigan played 75 fifth-year seniors last year, and they're all gone. They're all gone. Everybody that mattered is gone. Michigan is actually returning 12 guys that made that got some form of all Big Ten recognition. 33 of the 47 counting specialist guys that were on the two deep for the Orange Bowl are back. There's actually quite a bit back on this team. You do understand, Steve, though, and for, for those people watching Michigan football outside of the maize and blue rooting interest, that when you see Aiden Hutchinson be a la Hugh Green of 1980, sure. and on the other side, David Ajabo, who was not being talked about at this time last year, become you know Robin to his Batman and mm-hmm. become this pass-rushing duo wrecking crew, and they're both gone, and then you see a Michigan offense that's predicated on the run game, and Hassan Haskins had the year that he had, and those three are gone, in addition to Dax Hill, who's considered veteran leader and athletic playmaker in the back seven, that just putting the, those core players together and then taking them out of the equation leads some people to believe, okay, step back. Totally, I can get that. Um, but I would expect people that do this for a living. I don't, I, I'm not mad that, you know, uh, Buckeye 69 me on Twitter hasn't done his in-depth analysis of the Michigan roster. I, I get mad and upset when I hear people that get paid to do this for a living, haven't done their homework to that level of, of all the thing the names you just mentioned, I'm going to tell you right now, the one I am the most concerned about replacing is Daxton Hill. Now, I love me some Aiden Hutchinson, man. I bought me the Aiden Hutchinson Michigan jersey. I bought me the Aiden Hutchinson Detroit Lions jersey, okay? I mean, I loved his dad as a player back in the day. I love me some Aiden. Him and Ojabo were the best pass rushing duo in Michigan football history. But I've also watched, this is going to be my 39th season of Michigan football. And Mark, I can't remember the time that Michigan couldn't rush the passer. Hell, we were rushing the passer in 2020. We just couldn't cover anybody on the back end. Right. Michigan's going to have schemes, players. Will they get 25 sacks out of two guys again? Well, of course not. And probably never again. And you almost never see that in college football. But the idea, well, I guess that just means they didn't recruit any defensive ends, rush ends. I mean, pretty much everybody that's played a meaningful snap on the edge for Michigan in the last 10 years has played in the NFL. So they're, they'll find guys. Daxton Hill was something unique that we have not typically had. And that is a safety with that level of explosiveness that could go man-to-man against receivers in the slot, blitz out of that uh, position, play physical and hold up against the run. You know, we don't end in a situation that we saw under Don Brown where you've got rugged safeties who are good Big Ten players but can't play man-to-man and they're trying to guard, you know, Ohio State and Penn State pro receivers 30 yards downfield on third and nine. I mean, he took all of that away. That's the one guy that – we, don't, we have not typically had in our program. The other guys, I mean, Hassan Haskins, halfway through the year, none of us thought he should even be the starting tailback. We thought Blake Corum should have been, right? So those are all things we've seen Michigan football be able to figure out a way to manufacture or replace. We're going to miss Aiden Hutchinson's leadership more than we're going to miss his sack 
um, his sack uh, potency. But from a physical standpoint, Daxton Hill, hell, we don't have a player like that in the Big Ten a lot, period. We just, I mean, those are the kinds of players that, I hate to say it, you frankly see more often in the SEC. I think we're going to miss him more. I think that's where the new D.C., Jesse Minner, who lost the lost out to Mike McDonald for the job a year ago, but comes out of the same exact system in Baltimore. I think that's where he's he's having a harder time from a skim, scheming standpoint, figuring out how do we replace that piece because of the versatility where you could basically play a nickel defense every single down and still hold up against the run. That's really hard to do at a college and pro level, and Dax Hill allowed us to do that. Yeah, so so more on uh, Jim Harbaugh at uh, Big Ten Media Days, if that's the direction we're going here. Um, because at this time last year, if you recall our exchanges at that point after Big Ten Media Days, I was impressed with Jim Harbaugh taking the coach speak to a different level, meaning that all the coaches are excited about their teams and they're all hard workers and doing the right things and they all say the same thing. But Jim Harbaugh was giving examples as to why this team was different, Mm -hmm. why this team was going to take additional steps. And he was also specific about why the coaching staff was going to work and was working well together and gelling together, challenging each other, and a great dynamic uh, was the result. Uh, and he did more of the same, I think, on this Big Ten Media Days. But I was I was uh, also intrigued by the two Ohio State connections that he didn't initiate, of course, but were asked of him. So you've got the, the Jim Harbaugh from the podium. You've got the side session with the Big Ten Network guys. You've got the side session with the uh, the media. And, of course, he was asked about Ryan Day and his relationship with Ryan Day. You caught that, right, Steve? Mm-hmm. Cordial. It's mm-hmm. cordial. But then he was asked in the follow-up about the comment about Ryan Day or some people are standing on third base and think they hit a triple. And of course he just, the, the, the grin on his face just opened up and then he, <laughs> you know, said no comment and he was off. But uh, obviously I went back to the post game after the Ohio state game, November 27th of last year to rewatch that statement to see how it was uttered at the time. And it was obviously about Ryan Day. We already knew that, but it was even in, in the moment, it couldn't be maneuvered any other way but to be about Ryan Day because the previous statements were made about comments made from the Ohio State camp about this rivalry, about this game, and what Ohio State was going to do to Michigan. And then that moved right into Harbaugh making the statement about Ryan Day. So that that was interesting to me, as well as him stating that uh, in this day of NIL, and I know you had your rant a few weeks ago about Michigan's lack of initiative in the NIL arena, but that if Ohio State's going to pay its players $13 million, or well, that's that's what's required by Ryan Day or what he foresees as being needed for the current roster, that Michigan could double that, according to Jim Harbaugh. So let's start with the former. I think Ryan Day is a very good football coach, but absolutely from a coaching perspective at Ohio State, he was born on third and credited with a triple. I mean, he this is not Woody Hayes taking over a program that had lost three in a row to Michigan, and he has to rebuild it. Um, he took over a program from a guy that has uh, – only Bo Schembechler has had a better record in the Big Ten since Woody Hayes uh, other than Urban Meyer. Jim Trestle's close. OK, so in, in Urban Meyer, you're talking about a guy, regardless of what you think, what kind of human he is um, from a coaching perspective, him and Nick Saban are the two greatest coaches in this sport since Bear and arguably two of the top three or four or five ever. And you took over with this program running at its peak, right? You're not Earl Bruce taking over for Woody, who had lost three in a row to Michigan. and didn't score an offensive touchdown all three years. This was a program still operating at its absolute pinnacle. You take that over. You have no previous head coaching experience. So you're not, you know, taking over the program that was, you know, in the in the doldrums that, that Jim was taking over in 2014 that had on-campus protests about the coach and the AD, the, the thing with, you know, um, putting the player back in with the, the concussion and all that stuff. So, yeah, I don't I, – I, I, I mean – I don't see where that's untrue, what he said. Um, oh, I don't have an issue with it. Uh, I, I just find it I just find it amusing. Okay. The, <laughs> that's the, about it. The, the other thing on the NIL is apparently we've lost enough recruits this cycle 
that we finally figured out we probably have a, need a better message where that is concerned. You know, I mean, just and I don't need to go back into that because you're right. I just did a whole show on this a few weeks ago, but I never believed for a second that Jimmy really bought the whole transactional or transformational, not transactional. I just think he's trying to come up with a talking point to uh, uh, to put lipstick on a pig. A new president just got anointed at Michigan, very pro-athletics. Frankly, he's got the most pro-athletics profile of any Michigan president since I've been a fan. Although, that's a pretty low bar if we're being honest, <laughs> okay? Uh, there, You know, M- Michigan is Cal Berkeley with a real athletic department, essentially, okay? So, but he's very pro-athletics, uh, helped build the program at Cincinnati, Um, when he was there, uh, helped get them to the Big 12 when he was there. He's already, you know, made more uh, overt references in his messaging to athletics than the previous guy who tried to shut the Big 10 football season down in 2020 did his entire tenure. So I think the mood and atmosphere on campus has changed. I think the reality of watching a kid that you recruited since the eighth grade go for go play for a defensive coordinator, a defensive coordinator, Go play quarterback for a defensive coordinator who's never been a head coach and whose team is about to not have a conference, whose who's boost, who's chief booster is literally on the phone cold calling conferences begging for his alma mater to get in. To lose that kid and some of the other recruits, they had no business losing this cycle. I think that combined with the more friendly people in the administration to the realities of this current situation, and I think you got to more in line with what Jimmy really thinks. Remember, he was lobbying for NIL and one-time transfer rules three or four years ago at Big Ten Media Days, right? And now yesterday you heard him lobby for Big Ten players to get to to share in television revenue. That's coming. I'm telling that'll come in the next couple of years. I know Sean Clifford just had a conversation with Kevin Warren about that, the the Penn State quarterback. So I think that that's a combination of Cha- vital changes in the administration at Michigan and also getting pimp slapped on the recruiting trail so far this cycle. So on the surface, uh, this seems like a bold move and statement by Jim Harbaugh to the commissioner of the Big Ten, what you just mentioned there. But if it's already in the works, maybe not as bold as it struck me at the time for Jim Harbaugh to be making a rather <laughs> decided suggestion to the commissioner and to the Big Ten that players should be paid. We're getting a ton of money in TV revenue, it should be going to the players. Mm-hmm. They should get their cut. So, so I thought that was pretty bold. And of course, the bold statement of the day. And I'm going to say it because regardless of your social, political views out there, anybody listening or watching, again, for a guy to be put on the spot and to make the statement, quote, and again, regardless of your position, you got to admire a guy that says, quote, what kind of guy or what kind of person would you be if you didn't stand up for what you believe in? Those are the kind of people we want leading young men in America are people that are going to stand up for what they believe in. And uh, I, I credit Jim Harbaugh for, uh, again, he didn't initiate the comments, but he answered the questions. You know, there's plenty of room over here on the maze and blue bus, brother. Plenty of room. Mm-hmm. We can make, we can, it's, it's called the big house. There's always room for one more, my friend. Always room. We don't, we have a, we have a fully insert, in, in, encircled stadium. We don't cut it off and call it a horseshoe, right? I mean, there's, the, the, it is the biggest house. There's plenty of room for one more, brother. Don't do that to me. That, that, <laughs> it's just awful to think about. All right. Before we let you go, the quarterback situation. So, How about the fact, number one, Cade McNamara is the first quarterback that Jim Harbaugh has ever taken at Big Ten Media Days. I think that tells you all you need to know. Maybe on second thought, in 2019, when the media actually picked us to win the league and Jimmy didn't bring Shea Patterson to Big Ten Media Days, that should have been a hit. You know what I'm saying? In hindsight, we should have been, eh, okay. But Cade McNamara does come, and classic Harbaugh line, He's going to be tough to beat out for the starting job. J.J. McCarthy's going to be tough to beat out for the starting job. All right? What's your take on this? Because here's the scuttlebutt on the Michigan side of things. Is if J.J. wins the job, none of us can figure out how would Cade play. Like, what would Cade do that J.J. can't? Right? Okay? What he add? What element would he add that J.J. doesn't already possess? But if Cade wins the job, 
then absolutely I think you'll see J.J. play even more than he did a year ago because he brings a lot more. He brings a lot. of I shouldn't say a lot. I don't make Cade look like he's a scrub, but he does bring several important things to the table that Cade does not, right? And so that's kind of our conventional wisdom. You're kind of nodding along with that. And yeah, that, and, and with and with with JJ having some pretty lucrative nil nil deals, from what I understand, then you know you give Kate his senior year, you let him start, particularly in the beginning of the year as the Big Ten champion quarterback. But more and more, JJ plays more and more, and and maybe you maybe you do try to do exactly again what you did last season. What do you think? Well, yeah, I've made the statement a couple of times on this show that. If Cade wins the starting job, JJ continues to provide you a skill set that Cade does not. Therefore, it makes sense that within the offense and to threaten the defense and change up the game plan and change up the, the look given to the defense that you bring in JJ for his interesting and different skill set than Cade. But if JJ wins the starting job, unless you're just giving Cade time just to give him time and placate him and and make him feel good, then there's there's no added benefit to just having Cade play a little bit. There is a true starting quarterback. You are the backup quarterback. You provide no additional skill set. You are the backup quarterback. What I find perplexing is that I hear this from fans. Okay, that's one thing. But I hear this from somewhat qualified media members that think – Jim Harbaugh has it in his head. J.J. McCarthy is going to get us to the promised land. He eventually needs to be the guy. Mm -hmm. But we're going to start out Cade because he won the Big Ten Championship. He hasn't done anything wrong. We're going to start him. And then at some magical time during the year that we're going to cut loose and we're going to make that transition. Well, Cade McNamara is not showing us and did not show us in 14 games last year that he's going to give up the job. You know, if he's got a 12 to 1 touchdown to pick ratio after five games, you can't just pull him justifiably. Right. Right. So this either needs to be a situation where Jim is saying, I truly am clearing my mind of everything I've seen and want to see happen in the future. And this is a flat out quarterback competition for August and the best quarterback is going to win. And then based on how they play, they're either going to maintain the job or they're going to lose it because I've got a great backup to go to. Or I want J.J. to be the quarterback but I don't know how to justify that except to say he beat him out in August camp. I can't let Cade start the season in game one play well because I can't make that move then and justify it. Therefore, J.J. is going to be the starting quarterback in game one. Before I let you go, Jake Butt, former Michigan All-American tight end, Mackey Award winner, Ohio native. He was on Sirius XM this morning and suggested, given how weak and anemic Michigan's opening three non-conference games are, and I love it, Give me all the scrubs, especially we're going to add USC to the league. We're going to play USC, Penn State, Ohio State, and Michigan State every year. By all means, just you know, line up the scrubs. No one cares. And and it builds a lot of team morale because everybody gets to play against those teams, right? No one's complaining about PT. He suggested that he could foresee the gym, given his NFL background, treat these as NFL preseason games where it is scripted that Cade plays for a quarter and a half, JJ plays for a quarter and a half, Obviously, you anticipate in the fourth quarter you got a big enough lead that you're emptying the bench at that point and that you use these three games like an NFL preseason to evaluate who is the full-fledged starter against Maryland to open the Big Ten season. What's your what's your thoughts on that? I don't have an issue with that. If they make it through the entire August camp and Jim Harbaugh legitimately feels as though, okay, I already know I've got two – good quarterbacks. I got two upper level quarterbacks, very different styles and ceilings, but two capable quarterbacks who can win. Then why not throw them out against live bullets and see the real deal, uh, albeit against inferior competition to see it in that and let them compete on the field. Yeah, I have no issue with that because I think the the gap between Michigan and those first three opponents is so decided that you can get away with that, but still it's game competition and let it ride and see who pulls through with their job on the line. Great stuff as always, Mark Rogers. Thanks for joining us again, my friend. Good to see you. Thank you, Steve. Give me a go blue, Mark. Just kidding, man. (laughs) This week's Twitter poll results. We asked you Michigan football season win total for this fall is nine and a half. Are you on the over or the under? That, by the way, that's two games more than Michigan's win total was last year. The over, 
76.8% gets the overwhelming response. I actually heard from a lot of Buckeyes. They're taking the over too. 23.2% of you said you're on the under. That would be disappointing with this team to go 9-3 and three with this team and this schedule. Which brings us to this week's feedback of the week. Dre, who's a Buckeye, agrees with me. Says it would be criminal if Michigan lost three games with that schedule. And Dre, I completely agree. It would be criminal. That'll do it for this week's episode of Michigan Podcast. Don't forget to like, rate, subscribe, follow, share, five-star review, whichever or however you access us, right, whether it's right here on YouTube or iTunes or Stitcher. Help us to find more Michigan fans just like you by doing those things so that the algorithmic gods will shine upon thee. Uh, you can also follow us on Twitter in between episodes at Michigan Podcast there as well. We will be back next week as we lay out our training camp preview. That's right. Camp starts for Michigan football next week. We'll lay out what we think are the biggest questions for training camp on next week's episode. Until then, I'm Steve Dace. We'll see you then. Go Blue.